Welcome back, we're on a sealed nectar. Uh, we're on page 53 of a little one. Uh, it's easier to carry around. And we're on the section that says rule and government among Arabs. Okay. Upon the defeat of Juhrum, the tribe of Kuza'a monopolized rulership over Maka. Mudo tribes, however, enjoyed three privileges. The first, leading pilgrims from Arafat to Muzdalifa, and during the rites at Mina on the day of sacrifice. This was the authority of the family of al gauth bin Mura, descendants of Elias bin Mudar, who were called Sufa. This privilege meant that the pilgrims were not allowed to throw stones at al Akaba until one of the Sufa men did that. When they finished stoning and wanted to leave the valley of Mina, Sufa men stood on the two sides of al Akaba, and nobody would pass that position until the men of Sufa passed and cleared the way for the pilgrims. When the Sufa perished, the family of Saud bin Zaid Manat from the Taman tribe inherited the responsibility. The second, al Ifada, leaving for Mina after Muzdalifa, on sacrifice morning, and this was the responsibility of the family of Adwan. The third, postponement of the sacred months, and this was the responsibility of the family of Tamim bin Ari from Bani Kinana. Kuza's reign in Mecca lasted for 300 years, during which the Adonines spread all over Najd and the sides of Bahrain and Iraq. While small branches of the Quraysh remained on the sides of Mecca, they were Halul, Sarim, and some other families of Kamana. They enjoyed no privileges over Mecca or the sacred house until the appearance of Qusay bin Khalib, whose father is said to have died when he was still a baby, and whose mother subsequently married Rabi'a bin Haram from the tribe of Bani Udra. Udra. This sounds like cool. All these different tribes. Rabia took his wife and her baby to his homeland on the borders of Syria. When Qusay became a young man, he returned to Makkah, which was ruled by the Hulal bin Habsha from Kuza, who gave Qusay his daughter, Hoba, a wife. After Hulal's death, a war between Kuza and the Quraysh broke out, resulting in Qusay taking hold of Makkah and the sacred house. It's interesting, like, the people want to be the ones to take over this territory, right? Wow, okay, so a war between the Kuza and the Quraysh. Okay, and then the next part says, The reasons of this war have been illustrated in three versions. The first, having noticed the spread of his offspring, increase of his property, and exalt of his honor after Hulal's death, Qusay found himself more entitled than the tribes of Kuza, and Banir Bakr to shoulder the responsibility of rulership over Mecca and the custodianship of the sacred house. Okay, he also advocated that the Quraysh were the chiefs of Ishmael's descendants, and he consulted Quraysh and Kinana to expel Kuza and Bani Bakr from Mecca, and they supported him. The second, the Kuza claimed that Hulal requested Qusay to hold custodianship of the Kaaba and rulership over Mecca after his death. The third, Hulal gave the right of the Kaaba service to his daughter Hoba and appointed Abu Ghubshan al Qusay to function as her agent whereof. Upon Hulal's death, Qusay bought this right for a leather bag of wine. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, which aroused dissatisfaction among the men of Kuza, and they tried to keep the custodianship of the sacred house away from Kuse. Anyone who takes like a bag of wine as payment, I don't know, you shouldn't do that. It's like, is it like 200 years old? Is it a San Giovese? I don't know, man. Was the grape smushed by somebody with like perfect feet that never touched the ground? I don't know. The latter, however, with the help of Quraysh and Kinana, managed to take over and to expel Kuza completely from Mecca. Whatever the truth might have been, the whole affair resulted in the reprobation of Sufa of their privileges. 
previously mentioned, evacuation of Kuza and Bakur from Mecca and transfer of rulership over Mecca and custodianship of the holy sanctuary to Kusay. After fierce wars between Kusay and Kuza, inflicting heavy casualties on both sides. We have, okay, we have to remember those two. Reconciliation and then arbitration of Yamur bin Auf from the tribe of Bakur, whose judgment entailed eligibility of Kusay's rulership over Mecca and custodianship of the sacred house. Kusay's responsibility for Kuza's bloodshed and imposition of blood money on Kuza and Banur, Banu Bakur, Kusay's reign over Mecca and the sacred house began in 440 CE and allowed him the Quraysh after him, absolute rulership over Mecca and undisputed custodianship of the sacred house to which Arabs from all over Arabia came to pay homage. Kusay brought his kinspeople to Mecca and allocated it to them, allowing Quraysh some dwellings there. And Nusa, the families of Safwan, Adwan, Mura bin Af, preserved the same rights they used to enjoy before his arrival. Wow, heavy casualties though on both sides for the Kusay and the Kuza, right? That's crazy. A significant achievement credited to Kusay was the establishment of An Nadwa House, an assembly house on the northern side of the Kaaba. Oh, so like a political building? To serve as a meeting place for the Quraysh. This was very beneficial for the Quraysh because it secured unity of opinions among them and cordial solutions to their problems. Yeah, you have to have a place to hash out them politics. Kusay enjoyed the following privileges of leadership and honor. 1. Presiding over An Nadwa House meetings. The consultations relating to serious issues were conducted there, and marriage contracts were announced. 2. The war standard. There could be no declaration of war except with his approval or the approval of one of his sons. Oh, okay. 3. Caravan leader. He was the commander of the caravans. No caravan from Mecca could depart, be it for trade or otherwise, except under his authority or the authority of one of his sons. Oh, okay, so like he really had a hold on trade. And imports, so imports and exports. 4. Doorkeeper of the Kaaba. He was the only one eligible to open its gate and was responsible for its service and protection. It's a heavy responsibility. 5. Providing water for the pilgrims. They would fill basins sweetened by dates and raisins for the pilgrims visiting Mecca to drink. I want to try to make that drink. Hot water, right? You rehydrate it and it gets all sweet. They sell these module dates um, in the market. I have raisins. Uh, 6. Feeding pilgrims. This means making food for pilgrims who cannot afford it. Kusay even imposed on Quraysh annual land tax for food, paid at the season of pilgrim. Oh, a land tax for food. Okay. It is noteworthy, however, that Kusay singled out Abid Manaf, a son of his, for honor and prestige, through, though he was not his elder son. Abdud Dar was, and entrusted him with such responsibilities as chairing and of the An Nadwa house. The standard, the doorkeeping of the Kaaba, providing water and food for pilgrims, due to the fact that Kusay's deeds were regarded as unquestionable and his orders invaluable, his death gave no rise to conflicts among his sons, but later it did among his grandchildren, for no sooner than Abid Manaf had died, his sons began to have rows with their cousins. Yeah, people get hungry for that power. Sons of Abdul Dar, which would have given risen to conflict and fighting among the whole tribe of Quraysh, had it not been for a peace treaty. Thereby, posts were reallocated to preserving, feeding, and providing water for pilgrims for the sons of Abid Manaf, while An Nadwa House, the flag and the doorkeeping of the Kaaba were maintained for the sons of Ab Abdul Dar. The sons of Abid Manaf, however, cast the lot for their charge. Consequently, they left the charge of food and water given to Hashim bin Abid Manaf, upon whose death the charge was to be taken over by a brother of his called al Mutalib bin Abid Manaf. After him, it was taken by Abdul Mutalib bin Hashim, the Prophet's grandfather. 
His sons assumed the position until the rise of Islam, during which Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib was in charge. Many other posts were distributed among people of Quraysh for establishing the pillars of a new democratic minor state with government offices and councils similar to those of today, and listed as follows are the sum of these posts. Hmm. 1. Casting the lots for the idols that was allocated to Banin Juma. Casting the lots. Like what you're going to do with it? Like to destroy him? 2. Noting of offers and sacrifices. Settlement of disputes and relevant issues were to lie in the hands of Ban Saim. Mm. Settlement disputes. Settlement of disputes. Oh, that must have been a headache of a job. Gotta listen to everyone's complaints. Three. Consultation was to go to Bani Assad. Four. Organization of blood money and fines was with Bani Tayyim. Five. Bearing the national banner was with Bani Umiya. Six. The military institute, footmen, and cavalry would be Bani Maksum's responsibility. Okay, he's in charge of the forces, right? Seven. Bani Adi would function as foreign ambassadors. You, you gotta have some of those. Okay. Next section says rulership in Pan Arabia. We have previously mentioned the Katanide and Adenide immigrations and division of Arabia between these two tribes. Those tribes dwelling near Hira were subordinate to the Arabian king of Hira, while those dwelling in the Syrian deserts were under domain of the Ghassanids, a sort of dependency that was really formal rather than actual. However, those living in the far-off desert areas enjoyed full autonomy. These tribes, in fact, had had heads chosen by whole tribes, which was a demi-government based on tribal solidarity and collective interest in defense of land and property. Heads of tribes enjoyed dictatorial privileges similar to those of kings and were rendered full obsessions and subordination in both war and peace. Rivalry among cousins for rulership, however, often drove them to outdo one another in entertaining guests. Yeah. That's a thing among certain rich people. They want to always kind of outdo each other, keeping up with the Joneses and then some. Affection, generosity, wisdom, and chivalry for the sole purpose of outranking their rivals and gaining fame among the people, especially poets, who were official spokesmen at the time. If you're doing it for fame, though, I don't know. I don't know. Hmm. Because, like, if oh, I'm going to give just to outrank you... Hmm, I don't know. Head of tribe and master had special claims to spoils of war, such as one-fourth of the spoils. Whatever he chose for himself or found on his way back or even the remaining indivisible spoils. You know, the, the post that they describe, right, of like, someone's in charge of the military, so they got foreign ambassadors, you got the treasurers, you know, even though it's, it says blood money, but still it's like a treasurer, right? What to do with the idols, so the folk aspect of society, someone's going to be in charge of that. The noting offers and sacrifices, so that's like the religious stuff, someone's got to be in charge of that. And then consultation, so counsel, so like if you need to counsel. It doesn't sound like something out of the norm, it seems like... In amongst tribes, these would be positions that are very relevant. Okay, we'll pause it here and then continue in the next section, the political situation.